Your newest book, Necessary Illusions, is subtitled Thought Control in Democratic Societies. How can there be thought control in a democratic society such as the United States? Isn't that a contradiction? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends what you mean by democracy. Uh, if you mean by democracy that uh, ordinary people should have a play a meaningful role in controlling public affairs and determining decisions about how the system works and so on, yeah, then it's a total contradiction. But the point is that elite elements, privileged elite elements, have never meant that by democracy. They've always regarded democracy as a threat, uh, which has to be contained and controlled. And this goes way back to the uh, first democratic revolutions in the 17th century in England. Uh, as soon as it became clear that you're going to lose, the, you know, that there would no longer be possible to control people by force, it immediately followed as an almost as a corollary that you're going to have to control what they think. Uh, if you have a, what we nowadays call a totalitarian state or a military-run state or whatever, you really don't care much about what people think. They can think anything they feel like uh, because you can control them with a bludgeon. But as the state loses its capacity to coerce through uh, threats or terror or just one or another form of force, uh, then other means have to be found to ensure that democracy doesn't work. Uh, that, the, that democratic forms, in other words, persist, but without interfering with the right of the privileged uh, uh, elements to rule. Now, you know, what the privileged elements are may differ in different societies. In modern capitalist democracies, the privileged sectors are those who own, are the corporate elite, basically. They own the country, more or less. And in fact, more, not less. They effectively own the country, and uh, the, and they basically control the political system. But in the United States, this really a one-party state. It's a business party with two factions. Uh, and uh, they control the media, the ideological system, and they impose very sharp constraints on any form of policy, any policy that's formulated, even, even if the political system ever got out of their control, which is unlikely. It couldn't get very far out because uh, the weapons of uh, capital strike and disinvestment and uh, reduction of business confidence and so on are sufficient to control policy. Uh, so there's, there's lots of mechanisms that ensure that those who own the country govern it. And we should bear in mind that that was the principle of the founding fathers, that those who own the country ought to govern it. That's, in fact, a quote from John Jay, the president of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, that's the way the country's founded. Now, the problem is how do you deal with all of this when people are free, as they are, like the state, they can't send in the police to break up this conversation. So how do you deal with that? Well, a lot of mechanisms are used, and one of them, the primary one, is thought control, indoctrination. That's what the phrase necessary illusions comes from. It's uh, not mine. It comes from uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, who's a leading Theologian. He's called the theologian of the establishment. He was the guru for the Kennedy intellectuals and uh, you know, George Kennan and so on, you know, a major figure in, in modern intellectual history. Uh, and he pointed out once that uh, the ordinary people don't have the capacity, according to him, to become involved in public affairs. Uh, so it's the task of uh, the, what he called the cool observers, meaning us smart guys, it's our task to impose necessary illusions and emotionally potent oversimplifications to keep these poor simpletons on course. Uh, and it would be kind of unfair to let ordinary people, to let the democratic process really work. If you really let ordinary people make decisions or, you know, think about things or whatever, they'd only get in trouble. Uh, it's like letting a three-year-old cross the street. You know, it's, it's to the interests of the three-year-old that you constrain them. Uh, and similarly, it's to the interests of the general public that you marginalize them and ensure that the formal political system has not very much substance uh, because it's only the smart guys, the cool observers, uh, who, uh, are, who uh, have the capacity to make the right decisions. And those. And now it turns out that the cool observers who are in a position to make the right decisions are those who serve the interests of private power. Uh, other cool observers are not cool observers because they have the wrong decisions. He didn't bother mentioning that part. Uh, and, and that's a very typical view. It's not just his view. In fact, it's probably the dominant view. So for example, the, uh, the book that I co-authored right before this one is 
called manufacturing consent, which borrows a phrase from Walter Lippmann, who's a sort of dean of American journalists and major foreign policy critic. Uh, and his view, sort of the same, was that you have to, that's a, it's a crucial part of democracy, he said, is the manufacture of consent. Uh, the population he referred to as the bewildered herd. And he said, we have to save ourselves from the rage and trampling of the bewildered herd. Uh, and since, unfortunately, you can't do it by force, you have to do it by other means. Uh, the other means would be the manufacture of consent. Uh, the United States, uh, the public relations industry in the United States, which goes back to the early part of the century, is dedicated uh, to that. It's a that's a pure business operation, and they're dedicated to it. Everything from, you know, advertising to other mechanisms of influence, and in which they openly call. And there are more honest days they openly call propaganda. And the same is true of much of the intellectual class. Uh, it's uh, it the more sophisticated people recognize that their job is uh, thought control and they have they argue that it's the right thing because the bewildered herd will only get into trouble if you let them rage on by themselves for thought control don't you need to, though, to have a complete control over a system no outside information coming in at all no not really in fact, that's the mistake that dictators usually make uh, dictators are usually much too crude uh, they have a ministry of truth which uh, you know blocks any wrong information. Actually, even in dictatorships, you know, there's usually quite a lot of give, but they have the capacity, at least, to control everything. Uh, our systems don't work like that at all. Uh, in fact, they're probably much more effective because they don't work like that. Uh, they have roughly the same effect, but they convey a sense of freedom. And the sense of freedom is real, like we can do what we're doing. You know, you can have a program in Salem which will, say, tell the truth about Panama. Uh, meanwhile, the three TV channels will be telling corporate government lies about Panama, but you're allowed to compete. That's what's called a free, free market. You know, like if you and I could sit down and decide to open a car manufacturing plant and nobody would stop us from competing with General Motors. Okay, we want to do it, that's fine. You know, police aren't going to stop us. That's a free society. Now, the effect will be exactly as if the police came in and stopped us. Uh, now, it's roughly the same in this case, you know. Uh, what are some necessary illusions in our society, and why are they necessary? Well, the basic, I mean, let's take, for example, the whole framework of modern, you know, international affairs. The basic framework is uh, there's uh, two big superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, ever since 1945. Two big superpowers. Uh, one of them is uh, committed to uh, freedom, democracy, human rights. Uh, it's, it plays a defensive, it's trying to defend these values. The other one uh, has vicious global designs. It's uh, inherently expansionist. It's trying to, uh, it, it's, trying to imp it's trying to conquer the world, destroy freedom, destroy democracy, and so on. And the good one, the good guys, that's us, uh, they have to contain the bad guys and we have to deter them and deter their global designs. And we have some problems because of the excess of tolerance and the, you know, the tolerance of dissent and all these, we're, so we're kind of softies where they're tough guys, uh, but nevertheless, that's what we have to do. Uh, that's the doctrine. That's the doctrine that you find in top-level planning documents. In fact, I've been virtually paraphrasing them. That's the doctrine that you have in the media and scholarship and so on. Uh, we contain and deter the Russians. Uh, and the Cold War uh, is now over because finally we contained and deterred them enough, uh, so they're giving up, and now, you know, democracy and peace everywhere. Well, that's, I mean, you know, there's like most systems of propaganda that you can think of, there's some vague element of reality behind that. Uh, like the Russians were, did play a very ugly role in their own empire and in their, which is, a, but it's a small empire. I mean, it's their own internal empire and the satellites. And of course, the satellites are the historic invasion route by which Russia has been attacked from the West and virtually destroyed three times this century. So not terribly surprising that they try to keep control over it. Outside of that, they've done virtually nothing except deter and contain the United States. So what we call Russian crimes uh, is, say, when we decide to attack and overthrow the government of Nicaragua and they provide it with assistance to defend itself from that attack. That's called Russian aggression. We've got to contain them. Uh, when we uh, invade in South Vietnam 
and, virtu and virtually destroy it and wipe out the South Vietnamese resistance. Uh, and then expand the war to the rest of Indochina, and the Russians provide people with arms to defend themselves. That's called Russian intervention or Russian aggression. We've got to stop them. Uh, in fact, there is no such event in American history as the attack against South Vietnam, although, of course, it took place uh, uh, just as much as the German attack against France or the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, the, and uh, that, that's a whole framework of illusion, and it's necessary because since the United States is a major terrorist state and an expansionist and aggressive power. And since the population obviously is not like that, uh, it all has to be framed in the uh, structure of defensive actions, uh, defense of human rights, and so on. So uh, uh, say uh, the fact that uh, American aid over the years has been very highly correlated with torture. That is, the more a state tortures its citizens, the more US aid it gets been established particular in Latin America, but all over the world, very good correlation. That, first of all, nobody would ever talk about it. And if they would, they would say, well, it's sort of an accident. You know, we didn't understand, or, you know, we made a mistake, or something like that. Uh, the, uh, uh, in the case of a U.S., let's take the whole Indochina War, if it went on for 30 years, there was never, except for the very outside periphery, any discussion of the fact that the United States was carrying out an aggressive attack against Indochina. Uh, it was all, uh, the, what the, the people who were called doves are the ones who said, well, the defense of South Vietnam was mistaken because maybe it cost us too much. I mean, it's kind of argument that the uh, Nazi general staff could have given after Stalingrad. Uh, the defense of uh, Europe from the Jews and the communists was a mistake because uh, we're not getting away with it. But that's, the, that's mainstream American opinion, including liberal opinion. Uh, those are all necessary illusions that we have to live by. They're similar ones internally. I mean, you have to live by the illusion that the democratic system actually functions and that the people are free to choose their own representatives and to determine what policies they'll follow and so on. That's very remote from reality because of the things we were talking about, but that's another necessary illusion. Conservative critics of the media say the press is too liberal and point to studies which claim reporters themselves are overwhelmingly liberal. Uh, what do you think of such criticism? Well, the studies are largely falsified, but there's some, in fact, if you take a look at, uh, um, you know, for example, there was a recent study of people invited on, uh, as experts on television, and they're all, I mean, they're overwhelmingly weighted over to the right, I mean, the American Enterprise Institute and so on. Uh, that. Uh, but, but nevertheless, so I, I think, the and if you, if you look at the actual studies, the, the Lichter and Rothman study, which is the main one, it's very seriously flawed. But I don't really think that's all too important because I basically agree with that. I mean, although the studies are very bad, uh, the fact of the matter is that by and large, the media do represent some sort of liberalism, like I suppose most journalists vote democratic. Uh, so that I agree with. But I think that that completely misunderstands the function of liberalism in, in a system of necessary illusions. In fact, if you look at my work, I mostly criticize the liberals, even the left liberals. I don't waste much time discussing George Will. That's a joke. Uh, but what's interesting to me is people like Anthony Lewis and Tom Wicker and, you know, the whole liberal establishment, the liberal journal, like, you know, the what's called the liberal establishment, the Times, the Post, you know, and so on. And I agree that they do generally represent liberalism. Uh, their liberalism is, uh, it, well, let's, let's take the Vietnam War again. Uh, there were hawks who said, if we try harder, we'll win. And then there were doves, the liberals, who said, well, it's costing us too much and probably it's not going to work, so let's not win. Now, I, personally, I much prefer the hawks, at least they're honest. Uh, the doves are just totally dishonest. They basically agree with the hawks. They just say, we're not going to get away with it. Uh, in fact, some of them said it explicitly. Like, say, Arthur Schlesinger, a leading liberal historian and spokesman, his view was, well, you know, I hope the hawks are right, but I don't think they are. And if they are right and we can win, even though we'll leave uh, ruin and destruction, he says, we'll all be praising the wisdom of the American government. It's just that it doesn't look like it's going to work. So what's the function of liberal? And that's quite typical, incidentally. Same on Panama. You know, the liberals are ones who say, well, maybe it's imprudent. You know, it's going to lose uh, 
our, it's going to harm our relations with Latin America, it's going to interfere with drugs and so on. That's not what they're saying in Latin America. What they're saying in Latin America is this is, uh, well, I guess just looking at the Honduran press, which is an ally, they're saying this is uh, international totalitarianism. Uh, they're saying it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the Colossus of the North is on the rampage again, and uh, it doesn't, it's totally lawless and violent. Uh, nobody can survive in its path. You know, that's not what the liberals are saying here. They're saying maybe it's going to be too costly and so on. That's quite typical. Uh, and what that means is that the role of liberalism is to set bounds on discussion. The, there's supposed to be a spectrum of discussion. That's very crucial if you want to establish illusions. You've got to make it look as if there's a debate going on. Uh, but you have to ensure that that debate is within very specific bounds. And the bounds of the debate, the assumptions of the debate, that's the propaganda system. Now, unless you accept those assumptions, you're not even part of the discussion. The assumptions are the United States has a right to do anything it feels like. We are stand for right and good is defined as what we do, except we're allowed to make mistakes sometimes because nobody's perfect. Uh, we are free and democratic. Whatever we have is basically perfect, aside from some mistakes which we can fix up. Uh, that's the bounds of the debate. Uh, if you accept that, you're part of the debate. And then you can be either a conservative who says, you know, let's be more brutal and harsh, or a liberal who says, well, you know, maybe it'll cost us too much unless we're a little softer. But you have to accept the assumptions. Uh, so during the Indochina War, say, the doves, as I said, they were the liberals. They said, well, maybe it won't work. Uh, if you're talking about uh, uh, domestic affairs, you know, the doves will say, oh, let's take, say, the corporate media, the, um, uh, the topic of this discussion. The, the, there's a range of opinion within the mainstream. There are some people who are worried that the media are getting too concentrated. You know, only a couple of corporations are running the whole thing, and there ought to be like 15 corporations running the whole thing. The, the, those are the liberals. The fact is, if there were 15 corporations running the whole thing, it would be scarcely different, maybe slightly more diverse, but the basic problem wouldn't be touched. Uh, the fact that there's a concentration of, there's such a narrow concentration of resources in the society itself that there's just no way for the media to r reflect anything but that concentration of power. As long as you got that concentration of capacity to decide what's invested and what's produced and so on, everything's going to affect it. If you try to make that statement, you're off the spectrum, even though it's trivial truth. So I, th I agree that the media are largely liberal, and I think that's part of the success of the system of indoctrination. I mean, if you can take the position, see if you can criticize the media as being too far to the left, that's terrific, because that means their subservience to power is already regarded as too much of a deviation. That's a fantastic propaganda device. In fact, if, if dictators had any brains, that's exactly what they would do. They would, in fact, it's interesting that they do do it. For example, at the, if you take a look at the Russian press during the invasion of Afghanistan, the party chiefs and the military were condemning the Russian press on exactly the grounds that the so-called conservatives here were criticizing the American press during the Vietnam War. They were criticizing the Russian press because it was telling all these stories about, you know, the tragedy of the helicopter pilots who were getting shot at and, you know, the soldiers on the ground everywhere you look, somebody's killing them and, uh, and the thing isn't working, you know, and it's all these mothers are in tears and, you know, they were giving all this story which was uh, just giving the wrong picture, it wasn't upbeat and optimistic. So uh, that's, that's, that's the way, uh, which is essentially the conservative line here with about as much merit. Uh, now, the American system is much more sophisticated. So the press really is dissident in this sense of accepting all the assumptions but saying they're not working. Uh, and that's marvelous because that uh, it makes it almost impossible to think anything except the assumptions. I mean, if you think, look, we're attacking South Vietnam, then your only attitude must be, I must be crazy. Because even the liberals aren't saying that, you know. And who could be farther out than those guys? I mean, if even Anthony Lewis and Tom Wicker are saying we're defending South Vietnam, well, you know, it's got to be true because those guys are far out leftists who are trying to attack the government. So, so that's a magnificent technique of control. In fact, I think, the, so to come back, I agree with the conservative critique of the media, and I think that's the strength of the indoctrination system, precisely. What do you say to people who think they're well informed by watching Nightline this week with David Brinkley and reading Time and Newsweek? 
Well, they are well informed in the doctrines of the propaganda system. Uh, no, you know, it's, it's not that you can't learn anything from it. If you look at it with a sufficiently skeptical and critical eye, you can pick things out. Uh, you can compare today's uh, lies with tomorrow's concessions, you know, and uh, you, you'll, you'll, and things dribble through. I mean, it's after, uh, it, remember, the media have to give a tolerably realistic picture of the world. They can't just give pure propaganda, even if they were just work. If, if they were just working for business, I, mean, I suppose that you know, that, like they're just working for business, which they aren't. They would still have to give a tolerably accurate view of the world because just think who their audience is. Their audience includes the people who are going to have to make the decisions, the junior managers in the businesses, for example. Now, they better know what the world is like or they'll have all sorts of, they'll make all kind of bad mistakes, the state managers and others. So yeah, if you read the, if you read the media with sufficient cynicism and criticism and you read it broadly enough, and you understand what's going on. You know, you understand that there's um, an intensive effort to uh, make you see things in a particular way, then you can resist. That's why there ought to be courses in intellectual self-defense, in my view. How can you uh, stay informed? What publications can you read considering the mainstream media is not sufficient? Well, yeah, it's, it's work. I mean, there, there is, first of all, I don't, I, I would say that there's nothing that you should read without a critical and skeptical eye. I mean, everything is written from some point of view, and you might as well figure out the point of view and try to compensate for it. Uh, and everything's selective, and so on. But uh, you can there, there is a diversity of things in the country. I mean, there's, for example, small magazines which give a very different picture. Uh, some of them are not so small, like say the Nation. Uh, some of them are really small, like Z, Z Magazine in Boston, which is one that I write for regularly. Uh, but if if you look at these things, you get a very different picture of the world. In my personal view, it's often a more accurate picture, but that's for people to decide for themselves. Anyway, you get a different picture, different information, uh, you know, you other sources. Uh, and if, if you really spend a lot of time on it, you can become informed. If you're interested, say, in Central America, the, uh, the organizations that are involved in actual work in Central America, say, solidarity groups or development groups or the church groups or whatever, almost all of them put out. Uh, information, usually from the ground, which just is far more accurate and extensive and, uh, than the stuff that comes out of the mainstream press and gives a very different picture. Uh, the point is that you have to work. And that's why, that's why the propaganda system is so successful. Uh, very few people are going to have the time or the energy or the commitment to carry out the constant battle that's required to get outside of, uh, you know, McNeil there or, uh, you know, Dan Rather or somebody like that. The easy thing to do, you know, you come home from work, you're tired, you had a busy day, you know, you're not going to spend the evening carrying out a research project. So you turn on the tube and you say it's probably right, you know, or you look at the headlines in the paper and then you watch the sports or something. Because uh, and, and that's, that's basically the way the system of indoctrination works. Sure, the other stuff is there, but you're going to have to work to find it. I've heard you have easier access to the major me media in other countries than you have in the U.S. That's just why, a, why is that? Well, I mean, if, if, if that weren't the case, I'd begin to think I'm doing something wrong. I mean, as, as soon as I cross the borders, whether it's Canada or, you know, like I was just in Scotland a couple of weeks ago, and so the whole British press was there, and I was on BBC and, you know, big thing all over the newspapers. Not just the local Scotland press, but the London press. And the same is true everywhere because they're, you know, pe people are interested in critical voices and so on. In the United States, and the same is true in Canada. Like this book, Necessary Illusions, was lectures over Canadian radio, national Canadian radio. Now they're being replayed over Australian national radio. They're never going to be played here, you can be sure of that. Same institutional arrangements in those well, countries. Yeah, same but same. they don't care much about critique. For, first of all, they, do, they don't care much about criticism of the United States. That doesn't harm them all that much. Uh, and if you start talking about Canada, I did quickly learn in Canada, then, you know, suddenly the things shut down. Uh, but also there's a, uh, there is, and, and don't forget a lot of these countries, like Canada, and Canada is a colony more or less, and becoming more and more of a colony. So they have the same kind of resentment toward the imperial power that you'll find, uh, you say, in, in um, Hungary towards Russia. Uh, and, uh, but, but also, don't forget that these countries do to some, to, uh, the United States is unusually narrow in the uh, spectrum of opinion that appears. I mean, what we call liberals here 
you know, when, when, the, when the conservatives say the press is too liberal, they're referring to people who would be called sort of center-right in much of the world. For example, can, have you heard of a socialist commentator in the United States? Uh, you know, in most countries of the world, well, yeah, the intellectuals are mostly socialists. In the United States, it's inconceivable. You know, no, no columnist can say, I'm a socialist. You know, people would think he's crazed. You know, well, what does that mean? You know, uh, that, uh, it's, uh, so the whole thing here is skewed very far to the right. Uh, that's because this is, you know, this is really the business society. Business is very class conscious. Uh, it's the only, it's, a, it, it's fighting a class war constantly and very consciously. Uh, and it's, uh, it's one major battle. It's one reason why the United States has such weak unions as compared with other industrial societies. Yeah. And why the United, States, the United States is the only major industrial country without a labor party or with no health insurance. You know, we're kind of off the spectrum as far as the industrial democracies go. If the U.S. declines, continues to decline economically relative to other countries, will we have more press freedom in the United States? Well, that's an interesting question. First of all, when we talk about the United States declining, while it's true, remember we're declining from a position of great superiority. So with all the decline, we're still by far the dominant economic and political and military force in the world. But it's going downhill. And the uh, things like, say, the Reaganite economics gave a serious blow to American society from which we'll be reeling for a long time. Uh, uh, but. Uh, it's hard to say what the effect will be. The, one of the effects are, is already evident. We've got an internal third world, which is very substantial. You go down to, say, Roxbury in Boston, uh, and the uh, conditions are like poor third world countries. Take a look at, say, mortality statistics or you know, health and so on. The figures are like, and the conditions of like, life are like the third world, and that's all over the country. Uh, it's very striking in things like homelessness, but it's equally, or, you know, crime and so on. But uh, we have, as you can't conceal it, a really two-tiered society. And this internal third world, that's where the labor force is going to come from. Next ten years or so, uh, probably half the jobs are going to have to be filled by black and Hispanic people. Uh, and corporations are now concerned about that. Uh, they're worried that they have an internal third world that isn't going to provide people with the skills and the, you know n knowing how to come places on time and how to push the keys on a computer or you know follow orders and so on that are required even to keep their system running. So it's p possible that there'll have to be adjustments to deal with that somehow. Uh, it's conceivable that as uh, as to what will happen during a period of relative decline could go either way. Could go towards more freedom or independence, or it could go towards more jingoism and uh, you know fear of the foreigner and so on, which is again an old American characteristic. You know. I think I heard you're a contributor to something called Project Censored, which puts out a list of news stories each year which are important but are drastically undercovered or even ignored by the mainstream media. What was the most important story of 1989 that was suppressed? most important story of 1989. I don't know, you picked the area of the world and there was an important story suppressed there, or, or at home. I mean, let's start with home. Uh, there was a major uh, minor strike in the United States in 1989, Pittston strike. That was really significant. It's the first strike since, uh, first of all, it's the first strike that's at least partially won. Uh, secondly, not much, but partially. Secondly, it's a uh, first strike since 1937 that involved sit-ins. Sit-ins are a serious matter. Sit-ins are it's one that's taken very seriously by business because sit-ins in a plant are just one step before the realization that you don't need the managers and the owners at all uh, because you know they're just there to exploit you and rob you. Uh, but why have them? You know, why not just take the plant and run it ourselves? I mean, that's bad news. You know, that would really bring about functioning democracy. Uh, so sit-ins are all serious and are always regarded as serious. It was the first one since 37. The thing got enormous local support, so much so that one of the union leaders ran on a, as a write-in candidate for the legislature and won against a judge who had handed down all sorts of uh, penalties against the union, which is unheard of in American politics. And they had a lot of union support from elsewhere, just a major event. Well, it happened to take place at the same time, roughly the same time as a minor strike in Siberia. Uh, now, the miners' strike in Siberia got a tremendous amount of coverage. 
and you know George Bush and all these guys are talking about the great Siberian workers. In fact, I think in his State of the Union speech, he said something about you know the the workers of the East and how they're fighting for their rights, and we're for them because we're always for the workers and that sort of thing. You know, real kind of sound like some Marxist ideal, but uh, that's okay when it's in Siberia. You know, uh, the Pittston strike was barely covered. In fact, I, I just read a, a report in the London press, London Guardian, by some journalist who went to stay in Camp Solidarity, the place where the Pittston strikers were, and wrote a very interesting report about it. And then and he's talking about it. He said, well, you know, finally he turned on the television as he was leaving, and he did see a very upbeat report about a minor strike. It was talking about, you know, the courage of the workers and how fantastic it is and so on. But of course they were talking about Siberia, you know, not the minor strike here. Uh, uh, the, uh, there were some press studies made, and it shows what you all know. There were polls taken. You ask people about the strike. Everybody knows about Siberia. Nobody knows about Pittston. That's completely typical. That's one story at home. Move across the border, you find them wherever you look. Uh, take, say, the Middle East. Uh, the United States in the Middle East, the Arab-Israeli conflict is serious. Uh, the United States is alone, alone in trying to block a peaceful settlement. We're the only country trying to block it. That's called the peace process here. And the other question is whether other countries will join us in the peace process, that is, the attempt to block a political settlement. Uh, that's a, you can't, that's just out of the media. Uh, Central America, uh, our, our uh, uh, clients, primary clients, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, they're continuing to carry out mass murder. It was a big fuss when they killed six Jesuits, right? Uh, yeah, that's bad, killing six priests. How about killing thousands of other people? Why isn't that bad? You know, uh, that, that's okay because nobody can see it, you know, so it's fine. Or Guatemala, the, uh, the, uh, the terror is mounting rapidly. Honduras, which is not at the level of the others, it's horrifying. I mean, people are starving. And, and Honduras, maybe 70% of the population is close to starvation. And that's gotten worse during the period of so-called democracy. They had an election in Honduras in November, two candidates. It got very well praised in the United States. It was described in the press as a milestone, in the globe, as a milestone in the progress of democracy that the United States has been sponsoring. Yeah, they had an election. Two candidates, one of them a wealthy industrialist, one a wealthy landowner. Uh, since they both had the same program, there was no discussion. Uh, meanwhile, uh, torture and death squad killings increased, and you know you find mutilated bodies in the streets. Uh, the uh, gap between the rich and the poor, which was always enormous, has gotten worse. Uh, so more people starving. But it's fine. It's a milestone of democracy. Okay, that's a story that's not covered. Uh, Takes a Nicaragua. Uh, they're having an election, and the question here is: Will the Sandinistas finally agree to have a free election? Well, that's not the story. They already had a free election in 1984. Uh, better than any other one in Central America outside of Costa Rica. Uh, but the United States didn't like it, so therefore it didn't happen. And therefore, as far as the media are concerned, they never had an election and they don't have an elected president. And the question is whether now the United States will finally have forced them into an election. Uh, and a, the line is, well, you know, the Contras and the embargo, they finally forced them to back down and cry uncle, now they're having an election. The 1990 election was scheduled six years ago. The, all this terror has done nothing except delay it, you know. Uh, and uh, the the United States is trying to buy is is doing everything it can to ensure that the election won't succeed. We don't we will not permit a free election there. In fact, we've told them straight out. The White House announced officially that unless Nicaraguans vote for our candidate, we're going to starve them to death. They said that if the uh, uh, if, if they vote for our person, Violeta Chamorro, our candidate, then we'll lift the embargo and give them aid and so on. If they vote for Daniel Ortega, we're going to just keep strangling him. So it's a free election. I suppose somebody came to, the, to you know, Lynn and said, you guys can vote for anybody you want for mayor, but if you vote for one guy, your children are going to starve. And if you vote for the other guy, maybe they'll have something to eat. Okay, that's not a free election anymore. Uh, but that's what we regard as a level playing field. All of this is accepted by the media as just normal. The only question is, will, they, will these evil Sandinistas go along? Uh, take any other part of the world you look at, and you find every, every story is a censored story, virtually. Uh, is because it's all 
distorted and slanted and suppressed in such a way as to as to satisfy uh, the needs of privilege and power here. Uh, you know, and I don't want to say it's a hundred percent. There's a margin of exception. There are there are, there are many. First of all, there are a fair number scattering of journalists in the mainstream media who understand the way the system works perfectly, and who do what they can to sort of sneak things through, and they often make a difference. And you know, there there, there are deviations of other kinds, but this this pattern is so pervasive that it's uh, uh, it's not much of an exaggeration to call it uniform. You've written that quote. My personal feeling is that citizens of democratic society should undertake a course of intellectual self-defense to protect themselves from manipulation and control. What did you mean by that? What, what would such a course well, be? Well, I don't mean go to school, because they're not going to get it there. Uh, it means uh, you have to develop an independent mind and work on it. Now, that's extremely hard to do alone. You know, uh, The beauty of our system is it isolates everybody. Each person is sitting alone in front of the tube. You know? Now, it's very hard to have ideas or thoughts under those circumstances. You can't fight the world alone. You know? uh, some people can, but it's pretty rare. Uh, first of all, you feel like you must be a nut or something, because how can I disagree with everybody? Uh, the, the, uh, the way to do it is through organization. So courses of intellectual self-defense will have to be in the context of political and other organization. Now, you, you find, if you read letters to the editor in the newspapers, it's kind of interesting to read them. They're off, I'll take, say, on Central America. You often find letters that are very well informed, that have all sorts of information that the media have not presented and have suppressed, that have the kind of analysis that's not sort of obvious when you think about it, but you'd never read it in the columns. Where, where are those people coming from? They're coming from the solidarity movements, like, you know, you, uh, which... Uh, are pretty widespread in the United States. In much of the country, it's kind of church-based. Some places, other things. Well, these these movements have developed their own forms of intellectual self-defense. They have publications. They have meetings. They have you know people get together. They sort of toss out ideas. They think about things. They they're critical. You know, and out of a milieu like that, you can mean you can develop a kind of an understanding of the world that's uh, that may very that may very well that at least reflect your own independent thought to some extent and won't just uh, mimic what you're being told to think by Dan Rather. Uh, that's, the, that's the way to do it. That's, what, that's why unions were so important. I mean, whatever you think about unions and corruption or anything else, they were a way for a, basically oppressed people to get together and work together and think together and interact and develop a, another culture, working class culture. Business has been very much committed to destroying that. They don't want a working class culture to exist. They want the only culture to exist to be the sitcom culture, which says, you know, aspire to greed uh, and to personal gain uh, and uh, nothing, nothing else. I mean, that, that's, that's, the ex that's the right culture. Uh, to have a working class culture with other values is extremely dangerous. And it's very hard to sustain those other values you know, commitment, say, solidarity with other people, or, you know, effort to sort of work together to uh, realize social needs. It's very hard to sustain that by yourself. You have to do it with people, pretty much. And that's what's required for intellectual self-defense. Uh, do you think cable TV opens up opportunities for more democratic media? or? or? Yeah, in theory, it sure, sure does. I mean, it's a matter of... Uh, it certainly uh, opens up lots of opportunities. There, are, you know, for one thing, it's much less controlled. It could be much more diverse. Um, it's, it's uh, again, it's largely a matter of resources, organization, and commitment. If, if they can be developed, I think there are a lot of possibilities there. I, I, I might say that in just short of cable TV, communities that have their own radio, say community-supported radio are often just very different in character. Boston area doesn't have that. Where, but, where is it? Where well, do they have it? Well, this guy who was interviewing me this morning, for example, an hour ago, this comes from Boulder, Colorado, uh, where, they, where he runs a news program for a, a KGNU, which is a listener-supported radio station. And it's a very lively station. I mean, they have real community participation. 
uh, listener supported to pay pay dues or something. Well, see, we have what's called listener supported. You know, GBH you send in ten bucks, and they send you a program, 30, but, you know. or whatever it is. But you know, you don't have any participation in it. You just watch, just like another television channel. You know, uh, I mean, if you like what they're doing, you can pay them, and they'll do more of it. Uh, but uh, real community-supported radio, listener-supported radio, involves community participation. That is, it's open to community groups, uh, and it reflects interests that they initiate. So it'll have, I mean, the reason he's interviewing me is because a lot of people supporting, involved in his radio station want to hear that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, uh, this, this happens in many parts of the country, and you can really see the difference. I spend a lot of time traveling around, and you can tell the communities that have it. They just have a different cultural level. Uh, and these community-supported stations are usually small, you know, low power, uh, uh, very little resources, but they make a difference. They're a, a way of, for people to become involved in things. Uh, a a, uh, um, a labor-oriented press would have the same effect. We this so out of the question in the United States we can't even dream of it. But in countries not much unlike us, say England, there was a major labor press, labor-based press, until the 1960s. And it disappeared only because of market pressures. It had a huge readership. It was high quality. Uh, its readers were interested in it. It couldn't get access to capital markets and advertisers, naturally, because that's business. Uh, so it went under. And you can see the effects. Uh, one effect was the decline of the Labor Party. Another was the decline of a working class culture. I mean, I'm old enough to have seen that happen in the United States. When I was a kid, my uh, family was mostly, you know, uncles and aunts and that sort of thing, were mostly um, working class, un but then largely unemployed working class in New York. And there was a very lively and exciting working class culture. By saying working class, I don't mean, you know, uh, I'm not saying, you know, low-level interests. I mean, it included the Budapest String Quartet and arguing about Freud, and uh, that was a very lively, in fact, the most intellectual environment I've ever been in. Uh, most, mostly unemployed workers, many of whom never went to school, easily competes with or beats the Harvard Faculty Club. But, uh, but it also had other values, uh, uh, and, and, those, and, that, and that's pretty much gone. Uh, and the destruction of that culture is a big victory for American capitalism. You can see it in simple things, like take around here. You remember the Eastern Strike last year? Uh, during the Eastern Strike, when, uh, when Eastern lowered its, its uh, fares to try to break the strike, virtually nobody thought twice about crossing the picket line. I mean, you know, sort of radical kids with backpacks and long hair I said, we're all excited because they get to New York for $10 or whatever it was. Um, the idea that you don't cross a picket line, you know, when I was a kid, that was like you don't steal food from a beggar, you know. You don't have to, you don't have to think about it. Uh, it's just sort of automatic. I mean, it's the only way that people have to defend themselves from private power is by striking. So you don't cross a picket line. I mean, you know, maybe you could find some exotic case where you would, but the assumption, like you might find an exotic case where you steal food from, food from a beggar too, but it's just the assumption, you know, the, the values are, yeah, poor people have a right to defend themselves. Uh, these weren't such poor people. They were pilots, but at least they were workers, you know, and they were fighting a much more powerful centralized system. So you don't cross a picket line. That's not part of the general culture anymore. Uh, and and uh, that, that reflects the uh, victory of uh, uh, corporate values over human values. Uh, and it's the kind of thing that will continue to happen. Things like community-supported radio or cable can help rebuild uh, 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 other, and in, in my view at least, much more healthy cultural systems. How do you rate the American me media's performance in the coverage of the invasion of Panama? I was a jingoistic hysteria as it was regarded everywhere in the world outside the United States. I mean, you take a look at the newspapers anywhere outside the United States and there, you know, you find people kind of uh, asking you know, what kind of madness is going on here. I mean, all this uh, hysterical frenzy uh, joy about uh, invading another country and killing hundreds or maybe thousands of people and destroying half the place, uh, violating international law, you know, what's the big excitement? 
uh, after having virtually destroyed the country by embargo and uh, economic warfare for the preceding two years. Uh, okay, I think I said the Honduran press just regard, re described it as uh, international totalitarianism, one of the kinder comments. Uh, but here it's uh, very upbeat. In fact, the reporting was just a joke. It was like the reporting in the Nazi press when they conquered the Low Countries. It was all about how you know, people were applauding the bombs and saying, oh boy, burn down my house too. Um, it really make me feel good, you know, and that sort of thing. Uh, plus, no questions at all about, oh, why? Why did we invade Panama? Uh, w I mean, you, you take a look at Ted Koppel or Peter Jennings or Dan Rather or any of these guys, and they tell you what's true. They say, look, Americans hate Noriega. Therefore, you don't really need an argument for why you invade Panama. He's just the kind of guy we love to hate in America. Well, why do we love to hate him in 1989 and not in, say, 1985? Was he, some, was he different? Yeah, he was different. He was a little less of a criminal in 1989. He was more of a criminal in 1985. Uh, so why do we hate him? Uh, well, something happened. You know, but what happened? Uh, you run through the pretexts. They, uh, they all collapse instantaneously. And the reason we hate him is because the U.S. government decided that he was getting too independent and he wasn't following orders, so they were going to get rid of him. And therefore, the media, like clockwork, uh, you know, stood at attention, marched in the parade, and turned him into a demon. That's why Americans hate him, because guys like Ted Koppel and Dan Rather and the rest of them know how to follow their marching orders. And if somebody is identified as a target of um, U.S. policy, who we have to get rid of, then you turn him into a, a demon, like, you know, Gaddafi or something. It doesn't matter whether he's good or bad or anything else. That's true, Noriega's a minor thug. He was also a minor thug when we loved him, you know. In fact, in many ways worse. Uh, no, so, but the, the, those simple questions like that just never get asked. I mean, the big, you know, we're supposed to have been terribly excited about, upset about the... Uh, t t t when Bush, you know, gave his big television speech uh, explaining why he was going to the press conference, explaining the invasion, uh, he, he got all emotional about uh, the fact that they had uh, uh, threatened an American woman. And he went on, you know, this kind of Ollie North rendition about uh, this president is not going to stand by while American womanhood is threatened. And the press was really excited about that. They, I remember the New York Times had an article saying uh, uh, Bush general is a man who generally has trouble expressing emotion in emotionally charged situations, but no one could question his deep feeling as he talked about this threat to the sanctity of American womanhood. You know, well, you can test that easily enough. Uh, six weeks before, uh, an American nun named Diana Mac Ortiz was kidnapped by security forces in Guatemala, it's their ally, uh, taken off to one of their torture chambers. Uh, sec abused, threatened, uh, you know, listening to torture in the background, mm -hmm. finally released because somebody figured out she's an American, this won't be a good idea. Uh, oh, that was November 2nd. Uh, stories were over the wires right away, so I picked them up. Nothing in the press, you know, the press doesn't care. Uh, no statement from the White House. Uh, the, the church in the United States and several congressional representatives pressed the White House to make some kind of statement about it at least. So it's none of our business. It's a matter for the Guatemalan police. Uh, what what, why wasn't this president exercised over that? Uh, right in the middle of all this frenzy, an American nun was killed in Nicaragua, along with a Nicaraguan nun, by U.S.-run terrorist forces. You know, there was never any doubt of it. It was witnessed by a couple of peasants who had been captured by the kid, by the Contras. Finally, like a month later, they sort of conceded that it had happened. So what did we do? Did we invade Washington? You know, did this did this president get deeply in you know big emotion because they killed an American nun, terrorist gangsters that he arms and controls? No. Did the press say anything about it? No. No. I mean, a little. They, some people said, look, it seems inconsistent or something. There's nothing inconsistent about it. It's completely consistent. Uh, if you want to invade a country, you'll pick up any excuse you like. If it's your gangsters who are carrying out atrocities, you'll try to suppress them. What's, what's inconsistent about that? Completely consistent. Uh, but it all just passes. And you, you, you take it case by case. Every single argument that was given for the invasion was so childish that it's almost embarrassing to, to refute it. But it was all accepted by the press. You know? I mean, it, not like, as I say, there's a fringe of exceptions. So say David Nyan in The Globe had a column in which he uh, 
I criticized the press in much harsher terms than I do. He said a bunch of boot licking, uh, you know, servants of power I and mean, stuff like that. Yeah, you can find a little fringe like that. But essentially everybody went along. Uh, the reporting on the scene was mostly very upbeat. Uh, the reporters were very careful not to look for civilian casualties. So they blamed the military for not uh, giving the civilian casualty figures. Well, what do you expect? You know, the military is obviously a propaganda agency. It's your job to find them. It's not very hard. Nobody stopped the press from going to the hospitals. If they went to the hospitals, and so fact, some of them did, like some of the Hispanic AP stringers went and reported, never got reported. Uh, but they find it on the wires. I mean, you know, they go into the hospitals, the morgues are overflowing, the hospital director gives an, makes an appeal to the Europeans to send um, drugs because the only, he says the only thing the United States sends us is bombs to destroy. Uh, it, when quail was in, uh, see now, now that the jingoist fanaticism has reduced a little, you're beginning to get at least some discussion, but take quail's trip to Panama. What you saw on television was cheering crowds, you know, thanks to the Americans. Uh, if you look carefully, you notice they're all white uh, because in, ha in fact it's a big race class issue there. Part of the purpose of this invasion is to give power over to, again, to the traditional tiny white rich elite that always ran the country and to take it away for, to eliminate again the black mestizo majority that's always been terribly oppressed and that did begin to get a bit of a share of power. Uh, so you take a look at the white faces, yeah, they're all cheering church, everybody's cheering, yay Americans, uh, stay here forever and so on. Uh, if you took a look at the, uh, the quail, is, although I didn't see any report of it, maybe there was some somewhere, but I didn't see any report of it, uh, quail also took a trip, a limousine tour through one of the poor black bombed out neighborhoods. Uh, there were reporters there. Uh, Rita Beanish of AP reported from that, and she says that in contrast to the uh, scenes in the white uh, middle-class areas, people looked out of their windows in stony silence, you know, as uh, Quail's motorcade went by. Well, nobody's stopping the reporters from discovering those facts, and they could, they could have been discovering it from the beginning. Uh, when they find people in the black areas thankful that finally the American troops arrived, they can also ask them why. And they'll get the answer. The answer is that American economic sanctions were, dis were killing them. And now maybe they'll end. You know, maybe now you know, Bush will build us a house or give us a job or something. Uh, whereas uh, as long as Noriega was there and the Americans were going to kill us, uh, all we do is starve. These questions seem so obvious, but yeah, they're very you write obvious. that you think that the well, let me take, unconscious of what they're doing. Well, you know, I don't know. You ask them. I mean, how, how much brilliance do you need to figure these questions out? I mean, the reporters are writing very upbeat uh, stories about how now we're going to rebuild the place. And they do sometimes report that the poor Panamanians are looking forward to, you know, American largesse. Well, here's an obvious question. What about the last couple countries we invaded with the same promises? What happened there? It's pretty hard to not think of that. In fact, what made it particularly hard not to think of it in this case was that the day of the invasion, December 20th, you turn to the back pages of the newspapers and you find an obituary for Herbert Blaise, the president of Grenada, uh, who we installed there after the last liberation. Now, you know, you've got to really try hard not to think of Grenada when this happens and you got Herbert Blaise obituary in the back page. So fine, let's have another reporter go to Grenada and see what's going on there. Well, you'll find what's going on. You, know, you, you read the graffiti on the walls, and they're not going to be Reagan the provider. They're going to be Reagan is the worst terrorist in the world, you know, uh, and, and Yankees get out and so on. And you look around Grenada, you'll figure out why. Uh, there was supposed to be a big, uh, when we invaded Grenada, there was lots of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The Americans are here. Uh, what happened, and, th and there was a certain amount of American aid that went in to try to stimulate U.S. investment and tourism. What's called aid, remember, is aid from the taxpayer in the United States to the rich folk in the United States, which happens to go through a foreign country. So, yeah, there was investment support, uh, inducements were given for American investors that didn't materialize. Uh, the uh, maybe 30 percent of the population is unemployed, uh, drug use and alcoholism have soared, homicides have soared. Uh, the state of emergency was instituted by 
uh, the government about six months ago to, with censorship. You know, you can't sing Calypso tunes unless the government decides they're not subversive. Uh, uh, you know, altogether, wonderful place, you know. Uh, uh, well, what happened? I mean, what, why is Panama going to be any different? Or, let's go back to the Dominican Republic, the last country we inv invaded before that. Again, big promises. Poverty is, in, in, it's a rich place, a lot of resources. Uh, maybe 25% of the population has fled to the United States. Uh, right in the middle of the Panama invasion, two ships sank. Uh, with boat people fleeing from the Dominican Republic to Puerto Rico, it's a hundred mile shark infested channel with hundred, you know, tens of thousands of people are trying to flee the country, more proportionally way more than from Vietnam. Um, estimates are it might actually amount to even a couple hundred thousand a year trying to flee. Many of them die, you know, they're because the boats sink, they're overloaded. Uh, a lot of if they're caught, they're returned by the Coast Guard or you know the American forces back to. Dominican Republic. Well, you know, none of that's ever reported. You know, it's over the wires. Reporters all see it, you know. But what kind of story is that? I mean, you don't get any political capital out of talking about that. It's not like talking about both people from Vietnam when you can say, oh, isn't communism awful? This is, isn't America awful, you know. I mean, here the richest country in the world invades a, 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 a potentially quite rich colony to overthrow a democratic government, which is what we did. Uh, and uh, uh, with all kind of promises about development, now it's catastrophe, you know, like it always was. There was no, nothing to be gained out of writing that story. So therefore, you don't have any reporters saying, well, what about Grenada, or what about the Dominican Republic, you know, I mean, if we're going to rebuild Panama, how come we did that there? And you don't, you can go on. I mean, you can go, I mean, why is Guatemala such a charnel house? Because we overthrew a democratic capitalist government in 1954 and have been intervening regularly since to make sure that there will be no possibility of democracy and social reform, and that the right people will be rich and the wrong people will be poor. Uh, and it's consistent. I mean, under the Reagan administration, uh, they, with enthusiasm, supported you know, something which the church down there called genocide. You know, maybe 100,000 people were slaughtered. Uh, real Pol Pot style, you know, torture, uh, mutilation. Uh, anybody? All we talk about is the triumph of democracy and how we're doing it again in Panama. What happens when you, have you ever confronted reporters who have written uh, these kind of useless stories and presented them with some other information and have they ever First of all, a lot of, well, the only reporters who would talk to me know about it already. Uh, and there are reporters who know about it and try to get something out. Uh, take, say, the Panama invasion. The, uh, the Globe sent down somebody who I don't know, a Hispanic reporter who covers the local beat, Diego Re Bonadera, I think his name is, uh, he actually wrote some stories in which he went to the, you know, which were, you know, he, he did the things that you're not supposed to do. He went into the poor sections, he talked to people, he discovered, for example, that uh, American troops have a list of people to be arrested, which includes most labor activists and most labor leaders and human, union activists in uh, Panama. And he uh, he went to the American command to the uh, uh, embassy, U.S. embassy, and asked how come all these guys are on the list. And they said, well, we don't know. We assume they're bad guys of some sort. Yeah, sure, they're bad guys of some sort, just like union leaders and political activists are bad guys everywhere else in Central America, where the United States has power. Uh, and a few other things. I mean, I don't know that this man, but I presume he, just reading what he wrote, I suspect he sees what's in front of his eyes. Uh, and uh, there are some other reporters who do. There's some very good reporters. Throughout the whole Indochina War, I had some good friends who were top flight reporters, you know, bureau chiefs for major newspapers and so on. Dick Dudman of the St. Louis Post Dispatch, first rate reporter. He told the truth about the war from the very beginning. Always understood very much what was going on. Worked, dug, got the story. There were, uh, there was reporter on the Chicago Daily News, Ray Coffey, there were some on the New York Daily News. Often it was the kind of not, you know, it was not the mainstream press, not the New York Times, you know. But off in other places, you, you find the people. support of their editors and they're also their publishers? Uh, yeah, and in fact, when you get away from the main ideological centers, the controls are more lax. So, you know, you ask about access to the American press before. Well, I'd have much more access to the American press, say, in Minneapolis than in Boston. 
uh, uh, so, you know, in Boston, which is a major ideological center, uh, the media are very tightly controlled. NPR, for example, uh, you know, public radio, which is sort of, that's liberal. That's what the conservatives would call liberal, rightly. I mean, it's a liberal establishment. Uh, but they are very careful about what gets on and what doesn't get on. Through, through the whole Vietnam War, for example, I was very well known around here, and I was in the media all over the place, but not in Boston. Uh, I think I was on GBH radio once for about five minutes during the whole Vietnam War. And uh, uh, because, you know, here the commissars run it. Uh, here you have liberal ideologues. I, I agree with the conservatives. You have liberal ideologues who are very careful to control what gets through uh, because they are really in charge of uh, indoctrination and sophisticated about it. And they certainly don't want to have that kind of critical voice. I mean, you know, again, it's not 100%, you know, like, but uh, it's what I just told you about the Vietnam War as an example. Uh, but when you, when you get away from New York and Boston and Washington and so on, things open up somewhat, mainly because it's considered less important. Now, it really doesn't matter much what people think in Des Moines. They're not going to be able to do anything about it anyway. It matters a lot what people think about it and think in Washington and Boston, because they can do something about it. That's incidentally another reason why I say the media in Canada are freer and more open. I mean, basically, they can't do anything about it. It's a